what the last three years. Uh, actually, she's been coming to this church since we started. And uh, last week, on Saturday after the service was over, Sydney uh, took Meredith and I aside and she said it's time to be baptized. So that's what we're going to do. I want to pray. I want to pray for her. If you'll join me in prayer, please. Lord, we thank you for this uh, beautiful young lady. We ask that you be with her today in a very special way. Lord, like all of us, she has her struggles, she has her doubts, she has her fears. But the one thing that's been steadfast in the whole thing is that you've been there with her. Lord, we don't even have to ask that you would stay with her because we know the truth, and that is that you are with her always. Lord, I'm just so excited to see that you're still at work in the hearts of young men and young women. Lord, we're thankful that she's part of our family. Lord, we're excited to watch her grow in her relationship with you. Looks like she's going to be a, a wife here soon. You bless her with children. That will be wonderful. <coughs> Lord, we're just happy to be a part of that. But we ask for your great blessing on her as she ventures off into the great unknown. But again, like we said before, we know one thing is so true, that you're with her always. Thank you for that. In your beautiful name, Jesus, we pray. Ready? Who's your one and only Lord and Savior, Sidney? Based on that confession, I now bury you in Christ. And like him, you'll be raised to new life. Trust in the mighty power of God that raised Christ from the dead. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Got the 
need to be contentment for a long time, and it's taken a long time because contentment isn't a weakness of mine. It's something that has never even existed in my life. It took me 27 years, well, about 24, to start finally learning the lesson. You see, my throughout most of my life, at least the first 24 years, I sought fulfillment in the things of this world. Anybody been there? Just constantly seeking to fill to the void. And where is it? What, what does it look like? Maybe for me it was, it was success if I had the, the house, the wife, the kids, the, the, the car, the dog. Well, maybe not the kids. The dog. <laughs> then I would be happy finally. And I started to, to collect most of these things. I started gathering. I had the, the, the house, the, the girl, the, the dog. Great job, everything. And it was empty. It took me about three months of having each of these things and, and finally realized there was zero fulfillment in this stuff. So God finally knocked me off of that fence, got my attention, brought me to his side of the fence and, and started to, to lead me into his way, to show me his word. And so I would read these verses like, uh, you know, Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Or 1 Timothy 6, 6, if we have food and clothing, let us be content. And I would read these things and it was kind of like, yeah, that, that sounds nice, it's poetic, but not really buying it, not really trusting in it. So God had finally shown me that my fulfillment wasn't in the things of this world, but I still wasn't ready to believe that it was fully in him. So I banged my head against that wall for a little while. Finally found out that, that, that it was in trusting him and, and truly walking with God and, and obeying his word. So then in my, my new level of discontentment, it was like, okay, God, I get it now. Contentment is in you. Fulfillment is in you. That's the only place I'll get it. So, so give me more, God. Give me more, 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 more. Just got baptized, I won't be walking on this water by the end of the week, God. Right? Anybody been there? God, give me more, give me more. I, I don't understand it, I don't believe it, I, I just need more of you, God. If I finally get more, then if I can just manifest more of the presence of God in my life, then I'll be fulfilled, then I'll be content. And finally, God brought me to this place and just showed me, dude, I, I've been here with you all along. You're fighting against me to try and get more of me. You're coming up with your own ways, your, 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 your own programs. Let's do this and then let's try this. And maybe if I read more, maybe if I pray more, maybe if I, if I memorize more verses. God's saying just, just know my word and follow it. God's word plus my obedience equals contentment. What I want to do tonight is I want to walk through each of these four phases that I've had to go through to, to finally start getting the truth of contentment. Everybody good with that if I don't have a mic? The only thing that's not going to work is the camera. Well, keep talking. You sound fine now. Yeah, but it's flat in the window here. Uh, God showed me that the fulfillment wasn't in the things of this world. But when he first showed that to me, I didn't believe it. So if you're at that level, uh, go with me actually to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. I want you to see what Solomon saw in the things of this world thinking that he could find fulfillment in the things of this world. The richest, wisest man ever. Again, please get a Bible in front of you, because we're going to read all of chapter 1 and half of chapter 2. So if you don't have a Bible in front of you, you're going to be bored. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. We'll go right to verse 2. Here's some encouragement. Everything is meaningless. <laughs> Says the teacher, completely meaningless. What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. The sun rises and the sun sets, then hurries around to rise again. The wind blows south and then turns north. Or 
around and around it goes, blowing in circles. Rivers, they run into the sea, but the sea, it, it's never full. Then the water returns again to the rivers and flows out again to the sea. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. Here it is. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. Verse 9. History merely repeats itself. It has all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. Sometimes people say, look, here's something new. But actually, it's old. <laughs> Nothing is ever truly new. Verse 11. We don't remember what happened in the past, and in future generations, no one will remember what we are doing now. He says, I, the teacher, was king of Israel, and I lived in Jerusalem. I devoted myself to search for understanding and to explore by wisdom everything being done under, under heaven. I soon discovered that God has dealt a tragic existence to the human race. You'll see why here in just a few minutes. Verse 14, he says, I observed everything going on under the sun, and really, it's all meaningless, like chasing the wind. What is wrong cannot be made right. What is missing cannot be recovered. I said to myself, look, I'm wiser than any of the kings who ruled in Jerusalem before me. I have greater wisdom and knowledge than any of them. So I set out to learn everything from wisdom to madness and folly. But I learned firsthand that pursuing all this is like chasing the wind. Verse 18, the greater my wisdom, the greater my grief. To increase knowledge only increases sorrow. There you go, intellect. Chapter 2, verse 1. I said to myself, come on, let's try pleasure. Let's look for the good things in life. But I found that this too was meaningless. So I said, laughter is silly. What, does, what good does it do to seek pleasure? After much thought, I decided to cheer myself with wine. I'll get drunk. And while still seeking wisdom, I clutched at foolishness. In this way, I tried to uh, experience the only happiness most people find during their brief life in this world. I also tried to find meaning by building huge homes for myself and by planting beautiful vineyards. I made gardens and parks, filling them with all kinds of fruit trees. I built reservoirs to collect the water to irrigate my many flourishing groves. I bought slaves, both men and women, and others were born into my household. I owned large herds and flocks. More than any of the kings who had lived in Jerusalem before me, I collected great sums of silver and gold, the treasure of many kings and provinces. I hired wonderful singers, both men and women, and had many beautiful concubines. I had everything a man could desire. Verse 9, so I became greater than all who had lived in Jerusalem before me, and my wisdom never failed me. Anything I wanted, I would take. I denied myself no pleasure. I even found great pleasure in hard work, a reward for all my labors. But as I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish, it was all so meaningless, like chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. Go back to verse 8. He said, I had everything a man could desire. Anything that you want, this guy had it. Probably times 10. Whatever it is that, that you view as your treasure in this world, he had it. And he said, it's all meaningless, like chasing the wind. You want to know what his conclusion was? Uh, go over to chapter 12 with me, just a few pages forward. The wisest, richest man in the world had everything any one of us could ever desire or place our hope in. Had everything this world has to offer. Chapter 12, verse 13. That's the whole story. Here now is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey His commandments. For this is everyone's duty. It says your only purpose in life to fear God, to obey Him, to follow God, to trust in Him. You're never going to find fulfillment in the things of this world. I tried. Plenty of you in here raised your hand. You tried. <clears throat> Yet we still somehow seem to go back to this. Still not fully trusting that God is enough. Not fully trusting that His Word is our fulfillment. That he knows the right way. And this is exactly what I did when God taught me this lesson. Like, all right, dude, dude I get it. I'm not going to find fulfillment in the things of this world. But, you know what? I, I'm not really fully trusting that God can give me the fulfillment that I need, that I seek. Solomon, in chapter 3, he wrote that God has written eternity on the human heart. That it's an eternal void that each of us fills. 
that's a void that only God can fulfill. And so I heard that, but I wasn't really buying it. Not really trusting it. Not really believing that God can give me what I need to, to fill this hole that each of it, each and every one of us has. This void. And so I would I would read his word that, you know, to seek first the kingdom and, and if we have food and clothing, be content. That's great, but I don't really trust God. If, just in case God doesn't come through, I'll be over here making sure I, I, I've got everything else lined up. Just in case. Just in case this, this obedience thing that Solomon talked about, in case that doesn't really come through for me, I'll still be building my, my little kingdom over here. Now go to Numbers with me, chapter 11. We'll see an example of exactly this in the, the Israelites whom God had rescued from Israel, or from Egypt. By this point, God has done these just crazy miracles. He's already part of the sea. He's already done each of the ten plagues. All of these crazy things that God had done for these people, showing his love for them, rescuing them from their slavery. All these crazy things that God has done for each and every one of us in here, rescuing us from our own slavery, slavery to sin, slavery to, to placing our hope in the things of this world, all the crazy things that God has already done, these, these massive miracles that God has worked. Everybody in here, if you're a believer, you've seen God work in your life. The Israelites saw the exact same thing. They were still doubting God. Still not trusting God, but their fulfillment was in Him. Chapter 11, verse 1. Look at Numbers. It says, Soon the people began to complain about their hardship, and the Lord heard everything they said. Then the Lord's anger blazed against them, and He sent a fire to rage among them, and He destroyed some of the people in the outskirts of the camp. Uh, anybody in here still just pleased with your <laughs> lot in life, with, like what you've got right now? Still not good enough. Jump down to verse 4. Then the foreign rabble who were traveling with the Israelites began to crave the good things of Egypt. And the people of Israel also began to complain. This is just two verses later. They were just destroyed two verses ago for complaining against God. But they're right back at it. I've done the exact same thing. Complain against God. Experience the joy in that. And then get right back to complaining against God. Verse 4. Then the foreign rabble who were traveling with the Israelites began to crave the good things of Egypt. And the people of Israel also began to complain. Oh, for some meat, they exclaimed. We remember the fish we used to eat for free in Egypt. Yeah, while you were slaves. You were forced to eat it. And we had all the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic we wanted. But now our appetites are gone. All we ever see is this manna. Jump down to verse 18 with me. This is God responding to the, to the people and their complaints. And he says, Say to the people, purify yourselves, for tomorrow you will have meat to eat. You were whining, and the Lord heard you when you cried, Oh, for some meat. We were better off in Egypt. Now the Lord will give you meat, and you will have to eat it. And it won't be for just a day or two or five or ten or even twenty. You will eat it for a whole month until you gag and are sick of it. For you have rejected the Lord who is here among you. And you have whined to him saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? God, why did you ever rescue me from my slavery? I'd rather be a slave and have meat to eat. Than to be in this desert right now with food falling from heaven, literally. Following God, yet not trusting in what he's provided not fulfilled in what he's giving. Always needing more, 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 God. I know that you're providing for me over here, but if I just get a little bit of this too, then maybe I'll be happy. Go to verse 31 with me. Now the Lord sent a wind that brought quail from the sea and let them fall all around the camp. For miles in every direction there were quail flying about three feet above the ground. So the people went out and caught quail all that day and throughout the night and all the next day, too. No one gathered less than 50 bushels. They spread the quail all around the camp to dry. But while they were gorging themselves on the meat, 
while it was still in their mouths, the anger of the Lord blazed against the people, and he struck them with a severe plague. I'll ask again, anybody else still displeased with what God's giving me right now? Anything else that you want a little bit more of? See, this is like the, the 15 year old that asks, Dad, Dad, can I please have a BMW for my first car? And then Dad's like, are you serious? Why would I be foolish enough to give you that? And God's doing the same thing here with the Israelites. I, I, I'm giving you what you need right now. Yet you want more, you need more in order to be fulfilled. Still believing that what God provides isn't enough. Or believing that God doesn't have the ability to provide for our fulfillment. Everything that we need in this life. And the guy making 60000 a year wants 70000 70000 wants 80000 The supervisor wants to be manager. The manager wants to be CEO. Nothing will ever be enough. Solomon in, the, in Ecclesiastes 5, he said how sad it is to believe that there's any fulfillment in money, to believe that riches will bring any joy. He said the only thing it's good for is to watch it slip through your hands. He was so rich he was entertained by watching the money fall out of his hand. You know what Jesus calls this person that still isn't satisfied with what God is providing? unbeliever. He said the unbeliever thinks about these things and still worrying about getting more and more and more. If I can just have God plus this, then I'll be fulfilled. If I can have God and, then I'll be content. Go to Matthew chapter 6 with me. Verse 19. serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other, 
You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and, and food, or food and drink, or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Verse 28, and why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wild flowers that are here today and that are thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? Here it is, verse 31. Don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. Your Heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God. I don't like this translation of this verse. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Jesus says the unbeliever spends his days worrying about I just don't have enough money in the bank account. If I can just get a little bit more, then, then I'll feel content. I'll, I'll feel satisfied and I'll, I'll feel secure. Jesus it says it's the unbeliever that worries about these things. The believer is fully content to just follow God's word and obey what he says. Believing still more in the temporary satisfaction of things and success than in the lasting joy available only in God is discontent. See, we as Christians, we're called to be content with, with our job. What job is it that you're working right now? If contentment is, is a derivative of obedience, are you being obedient in your current job? Are you fulfilling your purpose in that job right now? What's your purpose? To make disciples of the world. Have you shared Christ with anybody in your current job? Are you still scared? Of it? Still scared they might think, ah, he's a weird guy at work now. Don't bother going near him. Don't bother near going her. Are you content with your job? Or do you need the, the next position, the supervisor, then the manager, then the CEO? If you're not being obedient, content in your current position, who would be foolish enough to entrust to you the next position? Go to uh, the book of Luke, chapter 16. Verse 10. Luke 16, 10. It says, if you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. If you're not fulfilling your responsibility, your purpose, where you're at now, why would we ever believe that you're going to fulfill that purpose elsewhere? In the next position up, with a higher pay grade, 60000 170000 Be content with your job. Where you are right now is exactly where God wants you. You know how I know? Because you're there. And because God is still in control of the universe. Be content with your church. You hear it all the time. I, I don't like the way we're doing this. And we're not doing this right. And I think we... And, 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 preach longer. Preach less. Preach louder. Preach quieter. Do more worship songs. Turn the lights down. Turn the lights up. Turn the music down. Turn the music up. Are we ever going to please everybody? No. Woo! Be content with your church. Are you serving your purpose in your church? You hear, I don't, I don't like it this way. Well, perhaps God doesn't want you to like it that way. Perhaps he wants you to like it his way. His way is teaching you exactly what he's trying to teach you right now. That it's not your way, it's his way. That his will is better than yours. That he loves you more than you love yourself. He loves you more than you love your satisfaction. Content with your job. Content with your church. Content with your spouse. Marriage ain't easy. Alright? 
Amen. Amen. This is too close. I wish my spouse would do it this way. I, I wish we would be able to spend more time doing this and contend with your spouse. It's exactly the spouse that you're supposed to be with, and you're learning exactly what you're supposed to be learning right now. You know how I know? It's God still in control of the universe. And that's where you're at right now. His will is better than yours. He loves you more than you love yourself. Content with wherever you're living right now. Oh, we need a bigger house. We need to paint this wall. We need to extend the roof. We need to... Are you appreciating the one that you're in now? Or are you more convinced that if you just get the next one, the bigger one, the better one, then you'll be happy? Let's read it again. If, if you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in larger ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And then verse 11. If you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And I know that's talking about money, but it applies universally. If you can't be trusted with whatever is in your life right now, with whatever God is teaching you, if you're not learning the lesson, you're not moving on. You gotta graduate fifth grade and move to sixth grade. If you fail, guess what? You repeat in fifth grade. If you are failing this message right now, if you are just striving with God, fighting with Him, God, I don't get it, do it my way. Listen up, God, Almighty me is speaking. It's not gonna go your way. His will is better, He loves you more. Get His way. Where He has you now, is where is absolutely best for you. And until you're content in that position, you're not moving forward. You better graduate. So God taught me this lesson, and then finally, okay, I get it, God. Step one, contentment, fulfillment isn't in the things of this world. And I don't need God plus the house, or God plus the car, or God plus anything. I don't need God plus anything. God. This word says, if we have food and clothing, let us be content. Because He provides that food and clothing. He loves us. So then we move on to the next phase. And alright, I'm all in. You got me, God. I'm, I'm on your team now. I get it. I'm not going to find fulfillment in the things. I'm not going to find fulfillment in you plus the things. It's all about you, God. So, give me more, God. Give me more. Give me more. Give me more. I'm ready, God. I want to I'm speaking tongues. I want to be walking on water. I want more today. 60,000 wants 70,000. The pastor of 500 wants 1,000. The individual disciple wants to evangelize to thousands. He wants to be Billy Graham. The guy with healing abilities wants to walk on water. All because all of God isn't enough. We want God plus a thousand members. We want God plus 500 converts. We want God plus a better singing voice. God plus speaking in tongues. God's sitting there like, am I not enough? Do you not trust that I desire to give that to you in perfect timing? Do you not trust that me, the creator of the universe, knows exactly when you'll be ready for this? Are you being obedient where you are today? See, these, these things, these, the next spiritual gift and, and moving forward, being sanctified, these are good desires. But if they're not God's desires, then they're absolute failure. It is a good desire to have a giant church with hundreds of Thousands of people just rushing in the door to, to just be excited about God. But guess what? If you're not ready for it, that's absolute failure. You see it all too many times. The pastor of these mega churches, they cheat on their wife, do drugs, and they kill themselves. What? How's that possible? Because we said, God, more, 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 more. Come on, give me more, give me more, give me more. Go back to Numbers chapter 11. Chapter 11, 
We've already seen what give me more, 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 more. Meant for the Israelites themselves, the people who, you know, they believed in God and everything, but they weren't really trusting in what He was providing. They needed God plus. So now let's see it in, in Moses, their leader, the guy through whom God parted the waters, through whom God did these crazy miracles. Even Moses is still distrusting in God. Numbers 11, verse 10. Moses heard all the families standing in the doorways of their tents whining, and the Lord became extremely angry, angry at the people. Moses was also very aggravated, and Moses said to the Lord, wait, what? Moses is ag aggravated with the Lord, not the people? Moses said to the Lord, why are you treating me, your servant, so harshly? Have mercy on me. What did I do to deserve the burden of all these people? Did I give birth to them? Did I bring them into the world? Why did you tell me to carry them in my arms like a mother carries a nursing baby? How can I carry them to the land you swore to give their ancestors? Where am I supposed to get meat for all these people? They keep whining to me saying, give us meat to eat. I can't carry all these people by myself. The load is far too heavy. Here it is, verse 15. If this is how you intend to treat me, just go ahead and kill me. Do me a favor and spare me this misery. Really, Moses? God just parted the oceans through you? And yet you still don't trust him. God plus, I need God and. God and my way. Go over to verse 17. This is God's response to Moses. I will come down and talk to you there. I will, I will take some of the spirit that is upon you, and I will put the spirit upon them also. Now, I don't know about you, but, like, I love you guys, but I don't want God taking any of his spirit from me to give to you. I think God's got enough that he can just give it to you without having to take any from me. <laughs> so perhaps that is a, a result of Moses whining against God. I don't know. I don't know the deep theology on that, but just wondering. He says, they will bear the burden of the people along with you, so you will not have to carry it alone. So God just appoint, or told Moses to appoint all these leaders to help him out. So he was whining. Go to verse 21. So after he tells him all this, Moses says, but, but Moses responded to the Lord, there are 600,000 foot soldiers here with me, and yet you say I will give them meat to eat for a whole month? Even if we butchered all our flocks and herds, would that satisfy them? Even if we caught all the fish in the sea, would that be enough? Then the Lord said to Moses, and I think I understand like this when he said it. Has my arm lost its power? <laughs> now you will see whether or not my word comes true. Like seriously, Moses? I just parted the waters through you. I just did each of these ten plagues. I just rescued a whole nation from slavery. You don't think I could give them food? Have I not been giving them food directly from heaven this whole time? And you're still not trusting? See, Moses still wasn't fully convinced. He still wasn't fully obedient to God's word. And even as the most passionate Christians, just on fire for God, and I want to serve you more and more and more, but I want to do it now, I want to do it today, Lord. Contentment is a matter of trusting God, and that He has our best interest at heart, and that He will provide. Trusting that he knows 
what's best right now, always. And that where he has us is exactly where is best for us. God loves us. He loves us more than we love our comfort. We want out from the trials. We want out from under that. His word says to bear down under it. He's got you exactly where he wants you. If you're in a trial right now, he's purifying you. He's making you a stronger Christian. Just as gold has to go through the fire and be purified over and over and over again. Each process, each cycle through getting rid of the sludge, it's exactly what we're doing. If you're in the trial right now, don't try and get out from under it. Stay in that fire. God's got you exactly where he wants you. That fire is because he loves you. Because he sees your potential to keep moving forward. He trusts you. He is entrusting this trial to you. That's a gift, not a curse. Now, if it's a consequence that you're in right now, that's your own fault. There's a difference between a consequence and a trial. If you're suffering the consequences of your actions, learn the lesson. Otherwise, you're going to do it again. Never go to fifth grade. If you're celebrating right now, don't you dare forget God. God gave you the ability to celebrate. Everybody here know the story of Nebuchadnezzar? Had, the, had one of the greatest kingdoms there was. He looked in the mirror and said, I built this. I think Satan did the same thing. He said, I built this. If you're celebrating right now, it's because God gave you the ability to celebrate. Trust that he has you exactly where he wants you. He loves you. A couple last verses. Go to the book of John with me. We're going to see the real model of contentment. And I know that Paul was a good example, but who better than Christ himself? Book of John, chapter 5, verse 19. Remember, God's word plus my obedience equals contentment. In John 5, 19, Jesus explained, I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the Father do. Whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him everything he is doing. Then go over to John chapter 12 with me, verse 49. John 12, 49. Jesus speaking again. He says, I will speak on my own authority. The Father who sent me has commanded me what to say and how to say it. And I know his commands lead to eternal life. So I say whatever the Father tells me to say. Jesus says, I, I do nothing of my own accord. I'm not out just wandering and maybe I'll try this and, and, and here's a good idea. No, he said, I, I just, I listen. God tells me, I do. Happiness. Fulfillment. Perfection. God's will. God speaks. He speaks to you right here. If you're not reading his word, don't expect to be content with anything. Because you don't have his word. You don't have his, his will leading you. God's word plus my obedience equals contentment. Go to John 14 with me. Verse 15. He says, If you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. Watch this. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. The world isn't looking for God. They're looking for their fulfillment elsewhere because they don't read his word. They don't listen when all of you guys in your jobs are telling them, Christ is what you need. Christ is what you're seeking. Go down to verse 21. It says, those who accept my commandments and obey them, they're the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them, and I will love them, and reveal myself to each of them. Last verses, and then we're finished here. Uh, John 15. Next page over. Verses 10 and 11. 
He says, when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. Again, God's word plus my obedience equals joy, equals content. Not God's word plus my ideas. Or God's word plus my shiny new car that's already rusting and breaking down. Or God's word plus that bigger house. Or God's word plus anything. It's just God. It's all you need. Because God knows your needs. He knows when to give it to you, how to give it to you. He loves you more than you can love yourself. Contentment is a matter of obedience. Obedience with trust. Trusting that as I'm obeying God's word, it is leading to the best possible outcome. Obedience without trust is slavery. Obedience with trust is freedom. Trust God's word. Trust where he has you now. Trust that he loves you. Be content. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much that, Lord, that you love us enough to give us your word. Lord, in all of our sin and all the ways that we turn against you, it would seem that we don't deserve your word, your love, Lord, your will. But that only makes sense to us, Lord. It doesn't make sense to you. Because you are love, Lord. You love us unconditionally. While we love in response, or remove our love as a response to things that are done around us or to us, Lord, you love us unconditionally. Because of that, you have a perfect will, which you reveal to us in your word, Lord. And that you desire to live through us by your Holy Spirit. Lord God, we pray that you just help us to be content, Lord. To get our eyes off of the things of this world. To get our eyes on 